All right, welcome everyone to the Coin Brief Podcast, number 21, uh, with your hosts, Sean Wentz and Evan Faggart. We talk about the latest news in the cryptocurrency and Bitcoin space uh, each week, and uh, all the latest innovations that are happening thanks to the fact that now everyone can, uh, you know, be their own bank and and manipulate their own money, uh, private money, independent of government. Um and also have programmable money um, that can be, you know, stored on a computer and do crazy stuff on the internet. So, uh, shakeups at the Bitcoin Foundation this week. Um, so, John Matonis, who was the previous executive director of of the Bitcoin Foundation, has left the foundation now uh, to pursue some private private venture. He's going to do something else. Um, maybe in the private sector. And now he's, be, he's being replaced by the former uh, general counsel of the foundation, which was Patrick Merck. Um, so yeah, uh, change, change up in the leadership now. Is this, is this a good thing or, or um, uh, a bad thing? Or is it somewhere in between this, this leadership shakeup? I mean, I don't think anything's really going to change. And I don't think it really matters either because... <clears throat> the Bitcoin Foundation has just become increasingly disconnected from the Bitcoin community. Um, and as an extension of that disconnection, uh, they've just, they're starting to lose their relevancy as well. Because people starting to? just don't. Well, I mean, yeah, they're not completely. Do they have any they left? Have... Seriously? Like, do, do, I mean, is there have, any they... more for them to destroy? They still have a lot of influence in the community. Like, uh, they're probably like the most well-funded Bitcoin organization, and they're like directly negotiating with governments to pass regulation that will affect everyone in the Bitcoin community. So, it's true. They're still very influential, even though everyone hates them. So we still but, have to pay um, attention to what to what they're doing. Uh, cause, cause they still hold so much influence and, and I, I, you know, I remember looking at the, um, their tax, their tax returns, uh, from last year as well. And like, you know, uh, it, it showed that, you know, $500,000, um, came from membership dues. That's half a million dollars from, from memberships, uh, that actual profit making, uh, you know, businesses in the space pay to the foundation, um, in exchange to to be members and have a voice in the foundation as well. Yeah. So where does the rest of their money come from though? Because I mean, they make more than half a million dollars because they make millions of dollars. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure actually. (laughs) Um, You know, it's it's a good question. Maybe some other Bitcoin ventures. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. But anyways, um, I mean, it doesn't, he doesn't really seem like he's going to like change anything or start doing anything new. Um, Like Coindesk covered this and um, he, they, they quoted him as saying that, you know, he would, he'd be willing to, you know, go against what, what's popular in the Bitcoin community and disappoint a lot of people and make them mad if it's as long as as it's for their own good he didn't say that directly but that's what i got from it it's just you know they're they're just gonna if they feel like it's necessary they'll just completely ignore the bitcoin community because they know the bitcoin community better than the people in the community know themselves so it's like or we're we're taking care of you we're like lobbying all for all this regulation because it's for your own good huh you know that doesn't so the message is still the same. The basic goals yeah. are still that. Their ba- their basic goals are just to ignore everyone in the Bitcoin community and use their money to buddy up with the government. Uh-huh. Um, and he said something else. Oh yeah, he he's he's planning to continue the the lobbying efforts that were started at some point last year. So yeah, yeah. Actually, oh, and, this this year they paid a huge, um, expensive lobbying firm in Washington D.C. Um, to lobby for them in Congress, and um, that was 
that was at least a hundred thousand dollars um judging by uh other clients of that particular lobbying firm and what they paid uh last year so so yeah um <laughs> they already made that purchase earlier this year they're gonna stick to it and um um yeah do you think that uh you know let's let's speculate just a little bit here like do you think that john matonis um left because of some sort of disagreement with the direction of the foundation um i don't know i mean you know that actually sounds like it would be possible because yeah. um <clears throat> before he was executive director of the bitcoin foundation he wrote like a few articles for forbes um expressing like like a really strong opposition to any kind of regulation um huh. on bitcoin like he he took an extremely libertarian stance and and then you know he got elected to be executive director of the bitcoin foundation and all of a sudden they're you know paying lobbyists to pass uh to to get restrictive legislation passed so yeah or not necessarily restrictive like they always like to you know point out and they've actually pointed out to us before like they don't want um restrictive reg regulation and in fact like they claim they don't want regulation at all but like that's where like the industry is heading already and they just want to have a voice in it but like i don't think that they want restrictive regulation i think that they were genuinely surprised when ben lasky's um proposed bit license came out and it was super super crazy restrictive and you know jim harper has expressed his um disappointment with that uh in the past but like I, I, you know, I don't, I, I don't think that they have ill intentions, but like, for some reason, they don't realize that their actions aren't achieving the good intentions that they claim that they have um, for the legislation. Right, because there's, there's no such thing as legislation that's not restrictive, right? Yeah, that's well, that's that's debatable depending on your political <laughs> viewpoint. But you, you can you like. Like, certain regulations are definitely worse than others, right? Like, some oh, are yeah, definitely, definitely way more restrictive and, like, like really out there and innovation-crushing than other types of regulation. Um, like, And we see that going point by point on the bit license. Like, certain provisions are definitely more damaging than others. But, like, it, it, you know, it, it makes you wonder, like, why... How come the Bitcoin Foundation wasn't able to um, get something that was less restrictive uh, in the first draft of the Bit license? And now we have Ben Lasky coming out and and you know, you know, giving permission to us uh, to you know, letting go of some provisions, saying that he's not going to regulate uh, software people, people who make software. Um, actual users who just hold Bitcoin. He keeps saying that he's only going to regulate the uh, financial intermediaries who hold people's money for them. You know, the Mt. Goxes and the... Ex he, he mentions that as something he wants to prevent in, an, in future exchanges. Yeah, but uh, he, can, he can say that all he wants. And, I mean, he can actually do that in the implementation stage. Um, but unless they actually change the language of, of the law, then there's no guarantee that that won't happen. Because somebody you know, the next superintendent can decide to enforce it in a way that <clears throat> does restrict those people. Right. But I, where I think Jim Harper really fell short in his um, responses to the Bitcoin Foundation was he focused too much on that additional information. Because, uh, like, in the first open letter he wrote to them, the main focus was, uh, was getting that additional information handed over to them from the foundation or from uh nydfs the justification really, the reasoning for and, their license right yeah and he, like he didn't he uh, he like suggested a, a way of a different system of uh instead of just having like one commenting period and then finalizing the legislation it would just be like a series of periods where they would release a proposal, you'd 
comment on it, you release another one, and so forth until they, until the community had no other comments left to say until they're completely satisfied with it. And mm. he he outlined that suggestion and then demanded the additional information. And then, uh, like a month or two later, in the official comment that the foundation that Jim Harper submitted on behalf of the foundation. Um, this was after they decided. The, this was after um, NYDFS decided to not release that information to the foundation. Mm -hmm. So once again, Jim Harper started talking about that some more instead of. I mean, the comment, the official comment, was 15 pages long, so I didn't read the whole thing. And so I'm sure they did talk about some like economic implications of the regulation, but. They focus too much on. I I just think he focused too much on bureaucratic stuff. Um, if I was in the position of Jim Harper and I was like, and I was um, like, a like a leader in a very influential organization, and I was writing a comment to the NYDFS, I would write like a multiple page thing, like fifteen to twenty pages, but it would be a point by point analysis of every single thing the legislation proposes and it would be a point by point analysis of what it would do I wouldn't mm -hmm. be like hounding them for you know bureaucratic things like give me this additional information change yeah. the way you operate your commenting system you know yeah, Jim I, Harper I kind of framed that like um <laughs> like he's trying to be too nice you know? Yeah, he's he's trying to be too nice. He's trying to be like a politician, play politics with them, um, play patty cakes, politics patty cakes with them, and 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 get their get their approval that way. Like he 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 made it sound like I I got you in this legal in this legal loophole. Like I I I got you guys. You're supposed to provide this reasoning a long time ago, and you didn't before you know before the regulations came out. So uh, aha, I I found you. I caught you in this in this screw up. But like they don't care. <laughs> what are yeah. you, you going to do? Sue them? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you would yeah, lose. They're probably. just like they're just like you know. Well, big deal. We're going to do it anyways. You know. Yeah. But yeah. It's just my opinion on it is, and you know, it's probably it's probably not this easy because I don't know because I've never been in a position that Jim Harper's in. But if I were in this a similar position as Jim Harper, I would like to think that I would press them really hard on the problems their regulation will create instead mm. of the you know procedural missteps they had yeah um because i don't really care so much about that because that's expected from you know freaking huge bureaucracies like the new york state government um yeah well i don't so, you know I, I don't know why jim harper didn't make those points but um fortunately those points were made by people in the community who submitted comments <laughs> to the Department of Financial Services, as well as um, companies in the space like Coinbase and BitPay, um, who have a lot of influence, a lot of clout. And, you know, uh, their their comments actually outlined a lot of these a lot of these issues and hindrance, hindrances that the bit license uh, creates or would create for them. So like that, that voice is is, you know, reaching the NYDFS. And uh, but like, it's just it's just weird how the Bitcoin Foundation itself doesn't make those points itself in a strong um, uh, way, you know, and 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 try and get that get that done. It's yeah, it's it's kind of odd. Yeah, but um, I guess there's not really anything we can do about it now because the commenting period is over mm -hmm. and. Um, as far as I know, whatever they come out with next is going to be final. That's what's going to be put into law. Yeah. But um, what ben, you said... ben Lasky actually he outlined the the time frame today at Money Twenty Twenty the new the latest time frame that we have. So like they're going to release the revised bit license sometime in December, and then once that is released, there's going to be another thirty day comment period once the revised license is released. And then after that, um, they are going to release the, the final like set in stone version. Um, he said hopefully in January, but possibly in February, basically just early 2014. So, and then, and then after that, like 
better be compliant, better get that license, especially if your business in, is in New York or if you you have customers or clients in New York and then get, you know, get compliant or else like they're going to come after you. I don't know. They're going to send you fines or something. It's unclear if like they're going to get sent to jail or, uh, you know, just fines at first. And then if they don't pay the fines, then, then go to jail. Like the penalties aren't really, uh, you know, explained at all. So yeah, I mean, I can't happens. imagine. I can't imagine that they would send them to jail. I would say just you know the very worst they would do would be to shut the business down if they don't, if they're not compliant. Yeah, kind you know, of like, like what happened with but with uh, Butterfly Labs. And yeah, that, and like that fraudulent activity. Like in in California, you know, if you go out, if you're in uh, at Venice Beach and you go out on the boardwalk with a, a lemonade stand without a license. Um, you know, they're not going to arrest you. They're just going to make you go home. But yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't know, that, dude. Um, like, there's, there's some restrict regulations on, on food these days. Like, yeah, that they're was, afraid that you're putting poison or something crazy in those drinks. Yeah, that, that was a reference to a news story from, like, last summer. This little kid, like, went with his dad to the boardwalk on Venice Beach to sell lemonade, and the cops, like, told him to go home because he didn't have a business license. <laughs> so <laughs> that's just, you know, it's just one it's example of how... some kids' dreams. It's just one example of, of how, like, messy and difficult bureaucracy is. And now that's, you know, being applied to Bitcoin. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to restrict the Bitcoin economy in New York regardless of how much they change it. Because at the end of the day... What they're doing is restricting who can run a Bitcoin business in their state. And there's no way of constructing regulation like that so that it's not restrictive because of its very nature is restrictive. Uh -huh. So yeah, either way, it's a, it's a, a loss for the Bitcoin economy. Would it have been better if like... I was thinking this when I watched his uh, Money 2020 speech. Like, would it have been better if they had gone, like, the certification route where uh, a business comes to them, um, you know, puts down all this evidence that they're legit and they take care of customers' funds and, you know, they have the cybersecurity and all this stuff. And then Ben Losky and his department hand them a certification that says these people are legit, they follow all the rules and everything. And, you know, ideally it wouldn't cost anything uh, because, you know, th this department, it's, its job is to, to, to regulate. So it would just certify these people for free um, and, you know, do audits on them periodically to make sure that they're financially stable. And, and, and all the businesses who don't necessarily go for that certification would be left alone and nothing bad would happen to them. Like why? Like why wouldn't they go that route um, of regulation? I was actually just getting ready to say something similar to that. Um, I was going to say that if if you absolutely have to pass regulation, which you know in this in this regulatory governmental atmosphere, you have to have regulation for anything to be considered legitimate. So mm -hmm. that's America. S since it's an absolute must. The least restrictive thing you could do was to just is to not require a license or really anything at all. It's just if you want to start a business, you have to register with the state. You don't have to like pass any kind of test or get any kind of licensure or anything. You just say, we're starting this business. This is who works for us. And this is our location. And we're going to be running our business now. And then NYDFS says, okay. And then they can just have this a ledger of Bitcoin businesses in New York, and that's how they keep can keep track of them. And they don't have to require them to, you know, have all these like security teams and all you know comply with all these things that cost money. Mm. They'll just have a list of people who are operating in their state, and if something goes wrong and the a company needs to be investigated, they have all the information right there. Uh, mm. so, you know, so it it would protect the customer and it would allow for you know, the maximum amount of freedom that can be allowed in a system that is inherently restrictive. 
Yeah, well, even in that scenario, though, there's there's probably still going to be the scam artists out there who just aren't going to register at all and, you know, keep operating their scammy business. Well, yeah, you, you always have people like that. Yeah. And, but, you know, you still have to get law enforcement to do investigation on those on those people. I mean, also, hopefully, you know, they would make that, you know, that list public so you could, like, go and look up, did they register with the NYDFS? And if not, then maybe they're not legitimate. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it it would also be cool if, like, they kind of um, added some nuance to it, like have different levels of certification, like your level one certification if you – um, only have proof of reserves and you know there's there's cryptographic proof that you have all the money that you claim that you do that you're solvent and so on and then a, like a level two certification where okay this person has the proof of solvency but they also have um, intense like cybersecurity measures for protecting people's funds protecting uh, the whole system from hackers and um, all the malicious actors who might try and break into into the site and and steal the funds, so like and then you know level three could be like something even extra more like oh, okay we also like keep track of everyone's transactions and we're a fully AML KYC compliant, and then like it, people could go and look up like um, which businesses are level one two or three and kind of decide who they want to do business with based on those levels like. That would be a pretty intelligent system that apparently Ben Lasky hasn't thought of or for some reason he has thought of but has decided that it's either too much work to implement or it wouldn't work for some reason. I don't know, but it seems like it would be better than the current crappy bit license that we have in the current incarnation. Anything's going to suck, though, in my opinion. We should just let it be Wild Wild West and everything will work itself out. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we can hope for something um, good. Like, well, we can hope for something good compared to the piece of turd, smelly <laughs> poop that came out <laughs> in July. Um, so, and I, you know, based on the speech today that he gave, like, he seems pretty clear that he's gonna um, water it down at least a little bit and take away some of the more egregious things that um you know have gotten the most pushback so like instead of hitting you with a hammer um he's gonna coat it in bubble wrap first and then smack <laughs> you with it it's a padded <laughs> hammer it won't hurt as much but yeah. it would still probably knock you out i saw that comment on reddit someone someone said that so i'm not gonna take credit for it but it's pretty <laughs> hilarious um do you know who peter serta is no okay well he's an economist and he writes about bitcoin um, mainly, like, where does Bitcoin value come from? What and website he made it, does he does he write for? Uh, he has he like has a personal blog called the Economics of Bitcoin. Oh, okay. And he recently um, made a blog post about BitLicense, and um, in that post he said, um, "When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail." You know. Kind of like a metaphor for what Ben Lasky is doing with bit license, or anyone who holds government power. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could, you could apply that really well to the federal government and the military-industrial complex. They've got hammers galore. <laughs> they've got so yep. many hammers, and um, and they've found plenty of nails in the Middle East over and over and over. Yep, it's ridiculous. Now we're killing hundreds of people with drones, and it's not doing anything apparently. Yeah, 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 I including like, American citizens as as well. A couple of them, yeah, and a and a sixteen year old kid as well who was one of those citizens. So yeah, like I saw I saw in the news that yep the U S like got all the big primary targets of like headquarters for ISIS, um, but all that has done is it's driven them further underground, and so they're hard to track, and it didn't really hinder their operations any, uh, in any significant way. Yeah, and they so, hide among the population as well. So that's it's not like yeah. they're all together in like one base where it's like, okay, hit them here, and then they're wiped out. Yeah, and plus, you know, all the military experts are saying that 
the, you know, they've said from the beginning that the drone strikes aren't going to fix anything. If you really want to wipe out ISIS, the only thing that will work is like a multi-year boots on the ground operation. And so like all the military experts are saying like, you know, the president is just wasting his time. He's wasting time and money. Yeah, he's going to kill a lot of people, but it's not going to, you know, diminish their effective strength at all. And uh -huh. but this is all this is a huge tangent. It has nothing to do with Bitcoin. But yeah, anyways, no. no, we're just this, <laughs> ranting about government. It's like it's just the drone strikes on ISIS is they are a complete 100 percent total political move. There was no intention at all of actually eliminating any threat the the president just wanted to appease both sides he like he wanted to make it look like he was doing something but he didn't want to put boots on the ground so he's saying oh well I'll do this so I'll be doing something it's not gonna actually accomplish anything but the Republicans will think that I'm actually taking having a strong military stance on the Middle East and the pro the anti-war democrats will say well at least he's not sending our children off to die so he's he's kind of trying to play both sides but really we're just wasting a bunch of money and killing people a lot of them are innocent people too yeah i so. mean yeah honestly that's straight up human rights abuses in my book when you're dropping bombs on cities and towns and massacring a bunch of innocent people like um like uh, that's that's a totally separate like issue than you know dropping bombs on suspected terrorists who who don't get a trial and who aren't an imminent threat to to the United States at that time and at that place. But then I mean that's a separate thing from like we kill a bunch of innocent people who definitely definitely are innocent and the government admits that they're innocent. Yeah, yeah, they they acknowledge that, which is crazy. Yeah, because they're like. Well, they don't have any like dedicated bases, so we just have to kill civilians, and that's just collateral damage. You know, it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but does anyone like accept that reasoning? You know, um, <laughs> no. Like, like when he wanted to when he wanted to bomb Syria, what was it like? Sixty or seventy percent of voters were like, "No, we don't want to do this." Yeah. And that's why they had to back off from the Syria bombings at that time last yeah. year. But now we're bombing Syria because, hey, ISIS is in Syria. They got what they wanted eventually, but just under a different pretense. Anyways, I guess we should probably start talking about Bitcoin again. So Yeah, we're on a Bitcoin podcast. So, What's our next topic? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, oh, we, ha we haven't mentioned yet that um, uh, another angle to the, to the Bit license thing is that um, up, up, the former chairman of the SEC um, actually came out and made a comment about Ben Lasky's DFS regulations and said that he likes it. And he thinks it's pretty good and approves of it. Um, and yeah, that's <laughs> is that surprising at all that a fellow regulator? Um, no, not at it? all. But I, th I think the real story is that he's an ex-chairman of the SEC. Uh, which is like the most powerful regulatory agency in the financial sector. And now he's working with Bitcoin. Um, my personal opinion, that's kind of, you know, suspicious. I like, I, I'm start I'm kind of like starting to see maybe this is like some foreshadowing the seeds of cronyism are being sown because, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, like in in like the mainstream economy, like you know, the stock market, the big banking industry, um banking executives um and government uh regulators, you know, they pass between public and private sector very fluidly and regularly. Yeah. <clears throat> like you know, and one, in one election like in one election cycle, this guy will be the head of the treasury and then in the next election cycle, that guy will have a job at Goldman Sachs as an executive. Um, so is that kind of what's what we might be seeing here? Like we have this huge um, regulatory guy um, now getting into the private sector of Bitcoin. You know, that could be, you know, 
could be some suspicious activity. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. Like, what if this guy is, um, he's joining BitPay and Varum as an advisor, uh, but like, you know, he, he could be angling for another uh, government job sometime in the future. Um, just, you know, maybe higher up on, on the chain. So he was previously the Securities and Exchange Commission yeah. chairman. Um, and also, so what could he go to back to? Fair, Maybe become the the Fed chairman. Also, to be fair, he's been retired since two thousand and six. So okay. you know, it's it's not like he was working for the SEC yesterday, and he just decided to come into Bitcoin today. That would be huge news, um, but but yeah. yeah. But so yeah, it, it's not exactly the same as what happens in the banking industry, where like people just you know flow between public and private sector regularly. Um, mm. But it, it is. This dude used to be really powerful, and there's no doubt that he probably still has some connections in the SEC. And now he's um, giving regulatory um, advice to to two, to two one major. Companies. One of them is a major payment processor, and the other one is um, Varum is the the company that Tim Draper is working with with his South American Bitcoin project. Yeah. So, and that's you know nineteen million dollars worth of Bitcoin in that yeah. particular scheme. But you know, I, it's 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 a it's a growing trend that um, these Bitcoin companies um, keep hiring uh, people to come advise them about regulatory issues. In this case, it just happened to be someone who was part of the regulatory sector before. But like you know, um, this. This is this is ha this is happening. Um, like an, another example is uh, a former PayPal executive um, left PayPal to become the compliance uh, lead at Bitstamp. So you know, there's there's people there's people getting hired um, and they're ch they're changing they're they're leaving whatever they were previously doing to join the cryptocurrency space as people who aren't you know, necessarily innovators or businessmen, but they're just there to basically talk about laws and uh, try and angle, you know, particular governments for favorable laws. Yeah, um, which, I mean, if, we're, if we want to be really, like, realistic and honest with ourselves, that is what has to happen. I mean, you know, as, I, as idealistic as I like to be, I also understand that, there's no possibility of Bitcoin being remaining unregulated forever. Um, so, yeah. so yeah, when we see when we see like people from big companies, um, big compliance officers or advisors or whatever from big companies coming into the cryptocurrency world, I think that's you know a pretty positive indicator that you know hey this is it's becoming pretty serious. Um, but then also when mm. you see former um, federal regulators getting in on it too. It's kind of like, hmm, this seems kind of insidious. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it it turns insidious if uh, they, you know, if these companies hire these people and then use them to angle for um, restrictive laws for the rest of the industry, uh, similar to regulatory capture, which is what happens in other yeah. industries, including the financial sector. So if they use these people um, as leverage, expert leverage, basically, to get laws that shut out their competitors, then that you know that turns into something that can can be kind of bad for the overall ecosystem, and in a way immoral. Um, but you know that's that's the that's the bad scenario, and you know we should give them the the benefit of the doubt and and say that you know um, yeah it's it's a it's it's a great development in the in the space that you know it's being taken seriously now by people who are associated with um, with the laws basically. Yeah, it's like, I mean, there's no doubt that it's really great that it's Bitcoin is becoming so serious that we have major you know really influential people getting in on it. Um, but also, I'm always, I'm also, I'm I'm always kind of wary about who it is, you know, what their, what their background is and what their motives might be. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of these companies, um, 
aren't necessarily like ideologically motivated. They just got into Bitcoin because they saw potential for huge profit, which is fine. Um, yeah. If there's any regular watches of the podcast, you'll know that I love I love chasing after profit. I think it's a great way to build society. But these people who aren't ideologically invested in Bitcoin, they're only in it for the business. Um, that's also an indicator that their views on influence uh, on getting influence with government to for their own benefit um, are not like they're okay with that is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Cause it would um, further their profits. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to bash profits at all. I don't want people to think I'm a socialist. Um, but also these, you have to be aware that these people who are chasing profits, they're also probably okay with using the government to push out competition, which is, which I'm not okay with. Yeah, and we, we see tons of that happening in other industries, in America at least. You know, it happens in the food industry, it happens in the financial industry, um, uh, pr practically anything. There's there's some form of regulatory capture. Um, and I guess I guess you're right, we've got to be on the lookout for that in the Bitcoin space. Because, uh, you know, I guess that's, you know, that's where we draw the line on profits, like, uh, don't you know, don't hurt people, don't hurt other people's freedoms to further uh, your own profits. Like, you know, don't, you know, don't try and create a, mono a monopoly for yourself, uh, like Comcast has done yeah. in, the, in the United States, trying to create a basic monopoly of telecommunications. They're trying to buy Time Warner right now, and, and they don't even, they don't deliver what their advertisements say that they're supposed to deliver in terms of you know, unlimited speeds and all that, and nobody likes their customer service, but they're basically allowed to keep being a crappy company because they're the only decent choice in so many areas in the whole country. And and they also maintain their monopoly by uh, getting, you know, favorable <laughs> laws passed in their favor. Um, you know, one, one, one perfect example of this in the Comcast case is how they have gotten um, states in the United States uh, to pass laws banning uh, individual municipalities from having their own internet uh, service. Yes. So, you know, individual communities can't even create their own public uh, internet service because it's against the law that Comcast helped pass through their regulatory capture. So like that's the nightmare, you know, scenario that is, you know, partially come to fruition in the United States and that we have to deal with now. Um, we just, you know, we have to be vigilant in the Bitcoin space and try not to let that happen as well in, in this new financial wild west, you know. But also what I think they don't realize is that, yeah, it's totally possible to establish themselves as these ISP monopolies. Um, but the market is eventually going to find a way around that because, you know, the market is composed of individuals and we're not, you know, static, like unmotivated zombies. We, you know, we want to make our lives better for ourselves. So we're going to look for alternatives and we're already seeing that. Um, on a much more obscure level, people are developing things like mesh nets, which I don't know much about them, but I think the ultimate goal of it is to have like a completely decentralized internet. Yeah, people um, were using that to protest in China. Yeah, because they China like shut down all internet communication, so they had so people would just use this mesh net app on their phones to message each other. Yeah, no but also we have either. also we have Google Fiber going around the country now. They mm -hmm. provide internet ac access that's way better than Comcast and Windstream and all the other ones. And everyone wants it, but they're going into individual cities and they're saying, we're not going to give your citizens access to this unless you give us the same privileges as the monopolies you've created. Um, nice. And, and the, you know, the local governments are being forced to concede to that um, because, you know, the... Their citizens will get really mad if they don't. So mm. it's important to realize that there, those monopolies aren't going to be around forever because they, at some point they'll be completely unsustainable. Either because they'll just become so big that they can't manage their finances efficiently, or 
people will just get so fed up with them that there will be really um, deadly competition. Yeah, there's a there's a real desire among like so many people to have faster internet um, at cheaper prices. You know, on par with the rest of the developed world. Um, you know, not even not even to mention South Korea, who who have insane speeds at relatively cheap prices. So, um, yeah, I, I guess it's just, it's a, it's a matter of like, you know, when, when are the people going to rise up and, uh, you know, ignore unjust laws and create their own internet service, um, regardless if they get a lawsuit from freaking Comcast or something like, it, it, you know, Martin Luther King had a, had a really good quote and pro other people have echoed <laughs> this as well. Like, you know, basically i'm paraphrasing here don't listen to unjust laws um it's not an unjust law is no law at all i think that's what the quote is okay yeah very nice very very eloquent um and, you know I, I i try and i try and you know look at the world through that lens like um if you consider yourself a responsible moral citizen um who who wants to do good in the world and do good by other people like uh, you you almost have to ignore unjust laws um you know if if only more people had ignored unjust laws in nazi germany um or or soviet russia you know like uh there's there's a certain point where it's like the government is creating really you know really bad rules that you know don't don't help people anymore it, it hurts people more than helps them and the, the people it does help is the people who have captured the government through regulations uh to shut out competition so yeah uh bringing back to bitcoin you know <laughs> <laughs> we were starting to see this kind of you know the fruits of this develop a little bit in in the bitcoin space it's fascinating to happen honestly like no matter no matter what happens um it's it's interesting to watch the politics uh play out on a macro level and see how this how, see how the cards fall um and you know like even even if restrictive regulations do get passed and the bit license is, is horrible and everything um like eric Voorhees made this point like people can just you know not not listen to it basically keep doing as you're doing and you know just take steps to hide your tracks better if you think that the uh, some kind of regulator is is on to you or something or just straight up leave the country leave leave for a more friendly country that isn't where the regulators can't get you so um yeah like it's it's you know it'll be fascinating to see how this all all this plays out and you know which which businesses um go for the license and who is like screw that uh screw your restrictive license i'm gonna do my own thing and uh and good luck to you ben lasky yeah <laughs> it, hopefully it, it's not that big of a deal but i honestly think um there'll be you know a few really big businesses to move into new york to take advantage of the restrictive atmosphere there mm. um but you like you won't see nearly as much um innovation as progress as we're seeing right now like you know, I keep I keep using this example on our podcast, but um, Mount Gox only happened, like Mount Gox only started having problems a year ago. It it didn't shut down until what like six months ago. But there's so much progress and innovation in the Bitcoin community, and information and knowledge and news moves so fast that Mount Gox seems like you know, a relic of history to us. Yeah. Um, yeah. That kind of, like, that kind of speed and innovative velocity, I think, will kind of slow down a little bit in New York when the regulation starts kicking in. Yeah, yeah, definitely. In, in New York, in that geographic area where people, you know, are more pressured to follow the regulations, um, like, yeah, that's, you won't, you won't really have a choice. Uh, that'll that'll be Ben Lasky land. It'll be ruled by Ben Lasky, and the Winklevoss twins, and you know the the handful of of exchanges and everything that are compliant there. 
And then, you know, the truly innovative businesses can just move to Silicon Valley or Texas or, I mean, really anywhere in the world. You can just, as long as you have an internet connection and a computer, you can, you can start up a business now in the Bitcoin space. It's pretty amazing stuff. So, um, I guess that, uh, pretty much covers it for this podcast. Um, you know, uh, thank you guys for, for watching. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, please like our video if you liked it and subscribe to us as well. Uh, follow us on Twitter, all that good stuff. Um, and yeah, uh, we'll be back next week with some more Bitcoin news in the space. I'm Sean Wentz. And I'm Evan Fagger. And thank you guys for watching. See you guys next week. Bye.